I know you're waiting expectantly for me to sing. <laughs> You'll have a long wait. <laughs> Open your bulletins. Inside you have an insert there for your sermon notes. The title of our message is The Power to Love. The Power to Love. How can we love the unlovable? Ronald Reagan, our 40th president, laid in the hospital bed, staring up at the ceiling tiles after he had been shot in the chest. He felt that he could not ask God for help at the same time while hatred burned towards the man who shot him. Reagan believed that we are all God's children and equally beloved by him. He began to pray for the soul of this young man. Could you love somebody who physically harmed you? Could you love those who hate you? The flippant answer tends to be yes, with a nod in the affirmative. Because secretly we think, nobody hates me. Have you looked at the comments on Amazon or YouTube in regards to anyone who associates himself with Jesus Christ or the Word of God? You find out that they hate them. The comments are mindless, vulgar, closed minded, ignorant, and spiteful. Yet Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And the world did indeed hate Jesus. It hated, the, hated him so much that you have a group of people who were his kinsmen were willing to conspire with their enemy, the Gentiles, and kill him. They put to death an innocent man so how are the followers of Jesus able to continue now that their leader is dead? Oh, the story doesn't end. For Jesus was resurrected from the dead and ascended to heaven. But now what? Those who killed Jesus were not dead. They had sent a clear message to anyone who followed Jesus that if you continue it in his teachings, you will die in like manner. Luke writes in Luke chapter 1 and in Acts chapter 1 to a man called Theophilus. Great name for your children. Everyone will remember him. Oh, Theophilus. <laughs> he writes him to encourage him and to challenge him with his faith, with the Acts of the Apostles. Luke did not include every apostle just those that were needed for the believers in Christ to overcome those who hated God with the love of Jesus. We have here in our hands a record of history. We have in our hands a record of theology. As a history, we see the birth, the adolescence, and the maturity of the church in 30 years. As a theology, we have in our hands how salvation came to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. Through Christ alone, by the works of the Holy Spirit, through men and women who spread the gospel through Jerusalem, then into Judea and Samaria, and all the way over into Walnut Creek. All parts of the world. This was done with infallible proofs, incredible promise, and with the ability to overcome intricate problems. Today our fo first point focuses on the infallible proofs. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1 as we look at verse, verses 1 and 3. And in the infallible proofs, there are two proofs that stand out in our text. I want you to listen carefully as I just focus on verse 3. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things concerning or pertaining the kingdom of God. 
Did you catch what those proofs were? The first proof is the evidence of the resurrection. The evidence cannot be denied or misunderstood. If you turn back to Luke chapter 24, Luke gives us three verifiable facts about the resurrection. The first in Luke chapter 24 is that Jesus is talking to the, to the apostles. They are found walking on the day of resurrection, confused, and Jesus comes up alongside of them and he begins to have a conversation with them. And yet they do not recognize him. Jesus is having a conversation. The dead do not talk. And yet he is there. The second thing, Jesus shows him his scars. They are gathered together in a room. They have doubts, and Jesus appears in their midst. They doubt what they see. So Jesus offers them their, his flesh. You can't believe what you see? Great. Put your hands in the wounds. Gross. Feel the scars and believe. And yet in their minds, they still doubted. The third part. Jesus ate food. Do you have anything to eat? Well, yes, we do. He picks it up and he eats it. The resurrected body has no need for food, yet Jesus takes the food and eats, demonstrating the reality of his presence. The second proof is the proof of Scripture. Did you notice the last half of verse 3? Let me read it again. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, the facts of Jesus' death and resurrection did not change God's plan for the kingdom. The suffering and apparent demise of the king does not seem to harmonize with the glorious picture of a monarch. Yet, as we follow through in the book of Acts, Peter's two sermons in Acts chapter 2 and 3 proclaim the evidence from Scripture that Jesus is the Christ. And Scripture unfolds through the prophets that Christ would suffer and that he would die. And perhaps this is illustrated no better than in, by Philip in Acts, Acts chapter 8. God tells Philip to go and meet this man from Ethiopia. And there he is standing in his convertible chariot, reading the prophet Isaiah. And Philip approaches him and says, Do you understand what you're reading? And the man scratches his head, if you will, and says, How can I understand unless someone explains this to me? Philip gets up with him and begins explaining to him Isaiah 53. Who is this man? Is he speaking of himself or of another? Philip says, no. He's speaking of Jesus Christ. The one who died. Who was crucified. Oh, but he's been resurrected. He is alive. The king is alive and well. And the kingdom will come. The evidence of the resurrection and scriptures are infallible proofs. They cannot be just to throw off to the side. They cannot be changed. Yet the ability required to present these truths are not found with the skill of men. They are not relied upon you and I with great speech, wonderful writing, dynamic technology to present them. Therefore, an incredible promise was given to the followers of Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, the promise is unique to the time of the church. Notice the two aspects concerning this incredible promise. First, there is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And second, the work of the Holy Spirit. Those are your fill-ins. As we turn our attention back to, to verse 4, notice the first aspect. Jesus commands the disciples to wait in Jerusalem until the coming of the Holy Spirit. And being assembled together, because that assemble, the, them being together, has the assumption that they are eating lunch. They're eating together. He says, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the promise of the Father. 
that you'd heard from me. Jesus told them of the coming of the Holy Spirit. How can it be to their advantage for Jesus to leave and the Holy Spirit to come? He is alive and he's standing there talking to them. What value is it to have the king leave and the third person of the Trinity to arrive? Turn with me to John chapter 14. John 14. John 14, 16, 26, 15, 26, and 17. I want to read those passages. Christ says, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, and he will abide with you forever. You will have the Holy Spirit with you forever. Not temporary. Not when you leave home. Not when you leave the city that you reside in. Not when you go off to work. He will be with you forever. When I sin, yep. When I praise the Lord, yes. Verse 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. The context, he's talking to the, the apostles. But they will be reminded of all the teachings that Christ had spent the last three years discussing with them. But it is the Holy Spirit who stirs the, our heart as we plant the word of God there and calls it to our mind when we need it the most. Chapter 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He is coming with a purpose. The focus for the Holy Spirit is not upon himself, not what he's doing, but he will constantly be pointing to Jesus Christ. That is his function. That is his purpose. That is his ministry. Chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you a truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. I am leaving, he says, and it's to your advantage. What is the work of the Holy Spirit, we might ask? Back in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, Jesus uses the baptism of John to picture the coming baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes upon every believer at the time of salvation. The Holy Spirit's work will em emphasize Jesus. Much of the Holy Spirit's work is explained in the early ministry of Jesus. Back in chapter 14 of John, verse 7 through 15, we see what that work is. Or he told them what that work would be. Oh, I'm telling you the wrong thing. It's 16. 16, 7. The work of the Holy Spirit is seen in three different aspects. His job is to convict of sin. You might be surprised to find out that the ministry belongs strictly to the Holy Spirit. There is no spirit-filled person who has the power or the spiritual gift to go around convicting other people of sin. So if someone comes up to you and says, I have the special gift and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to point out to you that you are a sinner. No, that's not our calling. That's not our ministry. That belongs to the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit's job. In verse 8 of chapter 16 in John, it says, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. Verse 9, of sin because they do not believe in me. That is the main sin that the Holy Spirit is concerned about. Secondly, the Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness. Of right, the righteous ruler is no longer present. Yet the Holy Spirit holds Jesus as a standard of righteousness. Well, I'm a pretty good person. As good as Jesus? He fulfilled the law perfectly. Can you? Can you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your heart? Can you get past that? Jesus could. Third thing. 
The Holy Spirit convicts us of judgment. There is a coming judgment upon the world. Unbelievers mock and praise the God of uniformity. All things continue as they did from the beginning. But the Holy Spirit is convincing mankind that payday is coming someday. The work of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the Holy Spirit is that promise that we were given. The Christian life is founded upon infallible proofs. And it's powered by an incredible promise. But that does not leave us without problems. As great as those two things are. In verse 6 through 8, the apostles have an intricate problem. Back in Acts chapter 1. We address our final point. And there are two parts to this problem. The first, of course, is the question that the apostles give. And the second is the answer that Christ gives to them. And as we read the passage, the problem is obviously displayed in a question. They say, when they had come together in verse 6, they asked him, saying, Lord, will this be the time that you restore the kingdom of Israel? The coming of the kingdom was greatly anticipated. Jesus preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Jesus preached that the kingdom of God was present in Matthew. The apostles heard this over and over again. The people of Israel believed and looked forward to a time of a kingdom. They knew what the dynamics of the kingdom was all about and who the leader was supposed to be. At least they knew his characteristics. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, explains who and what he was to look like, their great leader. And yet many, many commenters have overreacted, overemphasized the historical dynamics that were taking place. Did Israel want the Romans off of them? Yes. Were they oppre- oppressed? Yes. Did they want independence and freedom? Yes. But that is not the reason the apostles were asking the question. You see, the answer comes with verse 7 and 8 together. The question is not a surprise because if we go back to verse 3, Christ was speaking to them about the kingdom of God. So the question is a natural reaction. Lord, is this the time? Is it now? They're concerned. When do we begin? For example... It's about noon. One might ask, when does lunch begin? It would be a natural thing to ask. It seems like things are moving towards that conclusion. And yet Jesus' answer answers this problem. He says, it is not for you to know the time or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but to contrast that Circle the word but. Draw a line connecting that to verse 7 if you need to. So you can see they are together. It changes the focus of being concerned about the time when something begins to a new focus. And that focus is Jesus. Not when it begins, but to be making sure that you are declaring the witness of Jesus Christ. But you shall receive power, when you shall receive power, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. How does that fit into the coming kingdom? There is a progression, there is a progressive spread of the gospel, and it begins in Jerusalem. And after it is spread in Jerusalem, it is to be spread to Samaria and Judah. And from there it is to go out into the whole world. And it is the good news, not that that Israel is going to be free, not that Israel is going to be a nation, not that Israel is going to rule its land that God had promised. It is that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. He died for the sins, but he is alive. That focus was given in Peter's speech to the Jews 
in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, and to the proselytes, and to everyone who was a good follower of the Old Testament. And then in chapter 13, there's a shift that takes place as Paul goes on his missionary journeys. But as Paul goes out to all the missionary, or to each location, he always looks for a synagogue. He always goes to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. The focus at this time period is not on when is the kingdom coming. It is, do you know who the king is? But I heard the king died. You heard wrong. He is alive and he is living. Oh, he's coming again. But do you know him? So Peter preaches. From Moses to the present. You killed him. Repent. Change your mind about who Jesus is. For the forgiveness of sins. Philip to the Ethiopian. And the Ethiopian's response is, what is hindering me from being baptized? Do you believe? Yes. Be joined. Paul's journeys. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Finally, towards the end in Acts 29, verse 29, turn with me, if you would please. Because there comes a time for an end. And Paul, 28, did I say 29? Thank you. There is no Acts 29, only in my mind. Acts 28, verse 28. Paul says, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. The constant response of the Jews has been no in Jerusalem, no in Samaria and Judah, no in the world. Oh yes, some have come, but as we look back at those 30 years, we see groups of people who believe that Jesus is God. He is my Savior. And from that, we see something new and dynamic taking place called the body of Christ. The gospel is spread by starting it at home. I'm sure you know the story of Hudson Taylor and his work in China. But did you know his work started at home? Before he went to China, he was in Hull, just like my last name, England. As a young doctor, as he was, he used to go around to different homes and attend the sick, as doctors did. In one of these houses, there was a very sick man who was a wicked sinner, and he had no time for God. Taylor used to do this. He would come into the man. The man would be lying in bed. Taylor would do the medical things that he would do. He did these kind of things to him by putting bandages on him, washing him, attending him, and giving him medicine. And every time that he finished the medical side of his work, Taylor would say to this man, now, my dear friend, I just want to say a few words to you about Jesus Christ, that he came into the world to save sinners, and he will save you if you believe in him. And every time that man would turn his face to the wall, he wouldn't listen. He sat his face as though it was made of cement, hard, hard expression against the gospel. Taylor came regularly, week after week, month after month, and every time he had done his medical work, he would attend the man by saying the same thing. Now, just a word about my Lord Jesus Christ who died for sinners. And the man would turn his face away and he wouldn't listen. One day when Taylor came, his heart was broken. He said, I go and do this time and time again, and yet the results are all the same. What's the use of wasting my breath? 
on this particular day, he came and he gave the medicine. He tended his body. He put his instruments into his case without a word, and he lifted his bag, and he walked towards the door. The man turned to him and said, Are you not going to say something to me? The man was listening. Taylor came running back with tears in his eyes. Man, I must tell you, Christ came to save your soul. Now he was listening. So what of you? Do you think you can love someone who has rejected you? Do you think you can love the unlovable? Did not Christ love you when you rejected him? Were we not all unlovable before Jesus? This summer, we will have children coming to this location from different backgrounds, different social classes, and some of them will be unlovable. And yet, do we not have the proof and the promise to overcome any problem that stands before us? We've got the proof here. Let us tell it. We've got the promise here, empowering us. Can we not overcome shyness that comes through the door? Let, it, let us not wait six weeks until vacation Bible school starts. Let us put that into practice this week amongst those that are around us. Those who maybe we've written off and saying, but they've done this and that to me. Maybe a letter or a phone call or an email. Maybe changing the way we communicate to people and putting Christ in our work. Proof, promise, what problem? Let's pray. Let me follow, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for your word. In this great book of Acts, that we see you doing something unique, calling people out by your name. That you might be glorified by the great work that you've done in them. And we stand in a time, Lord, in which it is a precious time. There are many still to be called. And as we look out amongst the societies that we live in, we see that there are few workers, and yet the harvest appears to be ready. Lord, we ask for your strength and guidance. Help us to be bold before you, that you might be glorified. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to ask the young people to come forward and, and sing a song that uh, it's called Love the Lord Your God. It's a fun song. I guess they will be breaking into parts. So guys, girls, come on up. <laughs>